So, good day, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. We see people coming in. Um, so we want to welcome everybody to our second webinar <clears throat> in the, uh, this series of webinar in cooperation with Access Coalition and the Initiative Vision of Sustainability. Our webinar today uh, is entitled Understanding Development Opportunities, Needs and Aspirations of People. So we can see that more people is coming in. So I uh, want to uh, say you welcome to our webinar. My name is Willington Ortiz. I am researcher at the Wuppertal Institute of Climate, Environment and Energy, and I will have the pleasure to facilitate the dialogue today. The webinar today will delve um, into one of the main aspects we identified in the first webinar uh, of this series, namely that in order to deploy the synergies between energy and sustainable development, it is wise to start by recognizing the strategies that people already apply in their life in order to ensure or to improve their, their livelihoods. And in, learn, in order to learn about this, how to do that, how to understand better those strategies, we have the fortune of having today two speakers with long experience and, and deep understanding of the energy access field. And, um, but before doing that, um, we would like to know a little bit about you, our audience. So we will set one poll, one question. My colleagues will help me with this question. So we will like to know where are you sitting now? <laughs> where are you connecting from? So are you um, hearing to us from Africa? Are you based in Asia, America or Europe or Oceania? Um, we are very curious to know who who is connecting today? Um, yeah, let's wait a couple of seconds. So I see some people joining in this moment. So please, uh, we would like to know where are you connecting from today? Mm, let me see. Uh, um, so, we see already, so all, most of the people have already uh, answered. Please, the ones that are coming in now, we are very curious about you. Where are you based? It would be interesting for us and the speakers to know where are you based. So we can probably now close our question. Um, our colleagues, well, well, wow, we have a lot of attendances from Africa, nice, uh, um, and Asia and Europe. Um, America is probably too early. <laughs> That's something that we already know. So thank you for being with us. Um, and this webinar um, will comprise two main blocks. In the first block, we will hear some talks prepared by the speakers. And in the second block, we like to spark an interactive discussion. So please take note of your comments and questions and share them with us on the chat of the webinar. We will collect them uh, for, the, for the second block. So you can start directly during the presentation, uh, making comments or, or questions. So let me introduce a little bit the topic uh, of our webinar today which directly connect with two main takeaways from our previous webinar. And if you missed the interesting talk we had at that time, so in March, you can find the recordings on our website. And my colleagues will uh, help me in um, 
share with you the, the link for, for that webinar. So at that webinar, we learned that Energy Access has uh, sent synergies to practically all other sustainable development goals. This, is, this issue is very well, um, very well illustrated with this uh, graphic that Dr. Long Seng Tuo showed to us at that time. And secondly, during the talk, it, becomes, it became clear that one meaningful strategy in order to deploy all or those synergies is to start by understanding how people are already acting upon their own livelihoods. So because it is within their livelihoods of people where, where all or, or many of these development issues or development dimensions become integrated, become together. So the, the silos of thinking uh, in, in health or energy or gender is, is, is somehow um, avoided because it is when, when you think about livelihoods of, of the people they, they live. Moreover, I think it is worth to go even a little bit deeper and ask again the question that uh, Amir Tassen raised it four decades ago. Probably we go to this next slide. Um, and I'm not pretend to go in detail on Sen's uh, thinking, but I think these ideas of understanding development through the evaluation of functionings and the assessment of capabilities can help us to think about this idea of energy as an enabler of development. So I would very surely, so Sam proposes the idea of functioning as the ability of people to do certain things or to, to achieve certain types of things, such as being free of avoidable morbidity or the ability to move about. Um, and human life is somehow both conditioned and facilitated by this set of functionings of which a person can choose. And this, this availability to choose this set of functionings is what he calls capabilities. And finally, one interesting point raised by Sen is that the evaluation about which functionings are more desirable than others is something that is that varies. It, it cannot be fully fixed. We, uh, he highlights that the evaluation can vary in two ways. First, because of the difference between uh, the conditions, the features, or let me say the culture also of single persons of single subjects or groups of subjects. And secondly, because the evaluation of what is more desirable may change once people reach or, or ensure some type of function, some, some set of function, some capabilities. And looking from, from our energy access perspective, sense reflections seem to invite us to start by understanding both the, the current state of capabilities, let me say, of the people, uh, the people we want to work with or we want to work, work for, and also to understand their own valuation of or, or aspiration of what a prosperous and fulfilling life should be. And, and I uh, would like to invite at this stage uh, um, Emmanuel Sioy to our digital stage. So Emmanuel, you can please come uh, and, uh, to us. Um, Emmanuel Sioy is a sustainable energy and climate resilient expert. He has more than 14 years experience working with international organizations and also as a private consultant. Um, he has diverse experience in design, planning, implementation of energy access projects. And um, uh, Emmanuel, you, you have worked in energy programs for international organizations such as IT Power, Practical Action, CAFOT. And he is currently consulting with the Loughborough University on energy planning um, in, in Kenya, so using the energy delivery model. So for this webinar, we invited uh, Emmanuel to share with us his experience in, in understanding what people value the most. So how, how can we better understand the particular priorities of people, Emmanuel, their, their aspiration for achieving prosperous and fulfilling life? Emmanuel, the floor is yours, please. Uh, hi, hi everyone. Hi. I hope you can hear me well. Yeah, we, we can hear you and we see your slides. Cool. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Linton. So, hi, welcome everybody. As I've been mentioned, my name is Emmanuel. And uh, to respond to Wellington's question, um, I'll be sharing some knowledge and experience of what we've been doing for the past four years, working with subnational governments here in Kenya, and especially how communities are involved in energy planning. So my initial slide is just to set a foundation on what approach we are using and the kind of results is giving us as compared to planning as business as usual. So the picture that um, the picture that you can see in the screen is one of the energy solutions that you'll come across everywhere you go where solar has been promoted as a solution. Luckily, you can see smiling women, they're happy about the solution. But the question that normally comes to mind is, is this solution really addressing the development priority needs of these particular women? And then again, who decides this priority needs? Is it the women or is it the practitioner <clears throat> or the promoter of this particular solution? So those are the underlying questions that every time this picture comes across, I come across this picture comes to mind. Um, I think from Otis' presentation, uh, we know the enabling role of energy and there are different terms that have been used. Others have been using total energy access to mean how does energy spur development at the household level, uh, community and even for productive uses. <clears throat> but then what is the problem? So, one is that you realize not many people, especially the last mile end users have access to modern energy. And then like in our context, energy has been planned top down. So somebody sits in a desk and then plan for the community or for the end users, imagining that that idea they are planning for will really address uh, the needs of the target population. Also, um, you realize that the social aspects are not really put into consideration. And by doing that, there are so many communities that really realize that these solutions don't address their development needs. Rather, it belongs to the person who's doing the implementation. And other challenges include lack of financial uh, lack of financial uh, capability to implement these solutions. So those are like the bigger challenges that underwrite the development of the energy sector. So what kind of solutions are we looking at? We are looking at delivering a solution that is viable. And we have like four blocks, four building blocks for a viable energy solution. So we're looking at a delivery model the social cultural context are put into this particular delivery model, the enabling environment factors, and the additional supporting services. So you don't just plan energy alone, but there are the supporting services that need to come into play. And by doing this, you're asking yourself, what, where do I start? And the approach that we've been using, what we are calling energy delivery model approach, Starts from the last mile end user wider development needs and understanding their gaps. In doing that, we're also looking at the aspects of inclusivity, then not just looking at community holistically, understand their varying, their varying needs, their varying capabilities, and their varying uh, things like risk that community members experience. So that has to be brought into perspective. Then there's the aspect of integrating financial, social, and environmental sustainability to maximize impact. So you might ask, what is the energy delivery? I think the delivery model looks at the core activities, inputs, and actors that are needed to deliver the solution or the energy services. And we are doing that with that aim of ensuring that the services are appropriate to the local context. And in this case, it should meet the end user need. So here, remember the question I asked about, uh, is the solution meeting the needs of those particular women? 
uh, the EDM tool tries actually to address that. Then the tool can also be used not only at planning at subnational, it's been tried to plan at even at a project level targeting the local communities and also even at a national level. So the toolkit is a six step process um, and I won't go into the detail, but some of the key characteristics looks at inclusivity, the iteration, the consideration of stakeholders, both those that you will work in defining the solution and also in the delivery of the solution itself. And the, it always consider aspects of synergies, risks, and how to manage those risks. Now, this is the tool that we used and we have been using now currently supporting another county in Kenya. Previously, 2018 to last year, we were working in Kitui. And by using this tool, there are several lessons that came to the fore as compared to if we had done it as a business as usual. So one of the critical learning was that the local communities we are working with are very knowledgeable about their context. As compared to an initial where you say perhaps they do not understand their context, our 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 experience with them is that they are very rich of knowledge about their context. Even though they are within the same geographical area, their context differ from place to place. Uh, secondly, what came out is that their needs, their development needs also differ from individual to individual. And you cannot then say, if you offer one solution, it will be a one size fits all, okay? Then uh, we also learned that the communities we are working with understand clearly what are their development needs. They know how to prioritize their development needs. For example, while we made it clear that it was an energy planning process, when we gave them the opportunity to really prioritize what will be their development needs, we were surprised that actually what will normally qualify as an energy priority didn't come up. Uh, things like cooking and household lighting really were not given a priority <clears throat> by the community members. And so in further understanding why that happened for them, they really didn't give much thought about energy as a standalone. They were looking at what is my development need? and how will these other uh, components come into place to help me meet my development needs. And so it brought out a strong component that when we are planning for energy, we have to look across sectors because energy alone is just a component of the bigger solution. Last but not least, uh, we understood that the community or the local people have a lot of power and ability to make or break any initiative. So here we are looking at, there are several examples, both in Kitui and across Kenya, where communities, based on their inert ability, have made a, an initiative succeed, and others have really stopped an initiative, uh, either run by the civil society organization or run by the devolved governments. Understanding that without their input, it doesn't qualify to belong to their to, to be called a community development project or an initiative that uh, is meant to, su to support or to benefit the local communities. So I think in many words, uh, that is the experience about involvement of the local communities and how their priority needs are put to the fore or are the center of focus when doing energy planning. Thanks, Emmanuel. Let, let's start, let's stay a little bit on the stage. I would like to to have one small question. You mentioned uh, the priorities um, were in different terms. Can you give us very shortly examples of what kind of priorities were prioritized by by communities? For, for example, in Kitui. Uh, okay. Yeah. So in our initial plan planning process, we reached out 
through different approaches. For example, household survey, keen formal interviews and focus group, trying to identify the different development needs across the county. And from that, we came up with a summary of 15 development needs uh, that each of uh, different groups had mentioned as their top priority. But before we say now let's work with this, of course, bearing in mind the limitation in resources, uh, we needed to really know what is this that matters to the community. So we had to organize several community workshops and in those particular workshops, the 15 needs were presented to the community members. And here community members were, is a mix of both what you'll call the farmers, the households, the technocrats, and all those people that qualify to be a community. And being given the opportunity to vote independently without influence, like a secret vote, uh, of the 15 needs, actually improved income from farming was given the top priority, followed by access to better health services, then access to water, clean water, in closer proximity of their households. Now remember that this was an energy plan, but looking mm -hmm. at those priorities, actually Very energy is not featuring anywhere at all. Yeah. Super. Thank, thank, oh, sorry. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you very much for for illustrating that in so so uh, specific, practical way. I would like now to to jump directly to to our uh, next speaker, um, and we'll have the chance to talk more with with Emmanuel. So please make your questions uh, in the chat. Uh, thanks to be with us, Ayu uh, Ayu Abdullah um, is co-executive director of Energy Action Partners an organization that focuses on collaborative methods and tools for ensuring community participation in the design and implementation of energy programs. Um, Ayu has long experience in conducting research in community-based electrification, uh, development uh, of participatory planning tools for rural energy systems, um, and she has also a, an incredible uh, background in, in engineering, aerospace engineering, and master uh, degree in in energy systems and managing, managing, management, sorry. <laughs> we invited Ayu to share with us some insights from, from her long experience with, with collaborative approaches. Ayu, you can share your slides. Probably my, my, my colleagues can help on, that you can prepare already. Um, and we propose to you the following question. So how can these priorities of, of people be translated into energy terms. So we, we heard from, from um, Emmanuel uh, that people are knowledgeable, they know what are their, their development priorities, etc. And when you ask and, and work in that way, you come up with ideas like uh, improve in incomes of farmers, improve health, clean water, and, and this is not like in terms of kilowatt hours. So, um, are you? Your floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm really pleased to be here and to have the opportunity to share um, some of our work. Let's see, is it not? Is it still showing? Yes. Okay. Now it's showing. It's very well. Thank you. All right. Great. Um, so, quick introduction. So, my name is Ayu, um, and I am the co executive director for the international nonprofit organization Energy Action Partners. And our organization focuses on collaborative and participatory um, approaches and projects to, to community energy and delivering energy services. And we have a special focus on, on mini grids um, as, as you know, our main um, sort of focus area. So I echo a lot of um, what Manuel was talking about and, and sharing with you know, communities having a lot of capacity and knowledge and, and basically um, what we need to be doing is, is definitely partnering with communities more. Um, we started, and, and I think we've come to very much a, a lot of the same conclusions. Um, we, we approach it from a slightly different perspective, kind of looking at the big picture of, of energy access, the sector in general, and kind of recognizing that um, the dominant priorities when we talk about mini grids as a solution to energy access is, you know, on these different um, components, 
such as technology and business models and financing and regulatory environments, which are all extremely important and very key um, to ensuring that you know, mini grids can be deployed and at scale in order to achieve SDG 7. But we recognized that one thing that was missing was really the community side um, of a lot of these you know, priorities. I mean, there's a lot of the focus is on supplying electricity and delivering electricity and not necessarily looking at how communities can be involved in, in ensuring that you know, um, all the development objectives that we are trying to achieve from electricity access is achieved. And so we think of the problem as really starting from the community, as in what, you know, very similar to what Manuel is talking about, what are the community's development goals? Um, and how can we achieve that through and, and change the way we do things with, you know, mini grids and energy access? So we definitely recognize that community engagement was kind of this gap or, or that there's insufficient attention being given to it. And what we mean by community engagement and community involvement, I mean, that, that varies because there's definitely um, different levels of involvement and different levels of engagement and activities that um, all stakeholders in the sector uh, kind of you know, are involved with and, and try to make happen. Um, at the very minimum level of community engagement, um, we, we usually think of it as you know, when, when you're consulting the community and you're, you're trying to obtain and receive information from them. And so in that sense, you know, that's when you, know, you usually do your questionnaires and your surveys and you try and obtain information from, from the community. And it's really, a lot of times it's a one-way exchange. Um, the next level up from that, like the next level of community engagement that we think about is um, a two-way exchange, where in, that kind, in those activities, you know, there's some capacity building component, there's some, um, some form or platform where communities are also building their understanding and their awareness of um, energy systems, their needs, their priorities. And in that sense, then we're also learning from them and they're also learning from us, us as external, external entities to the community. And so then there's really a two-way exchange of knowledge and experience happening. And then of course, the highest level of engagement is when communities are fully involved and there's buy-in into all the decision making that happens around different um, energy systems and, and projects. And so then they're involved in the planning, the management, and it really leverages on you know, their local institutions and authorities, leverages and recognizes and respects it. And so that's the highest level of engagement that we usually try and think of and, and try to achieve through um, our work. And um, you know, when you don't have any of these um, forms of community engagement, then you know, any, any system project or intervention that you try and implement will have you know, challenges right, and problems. And when we're thinking of energy systems and how you know, the lack of community engagement, what that translates to is usually you know, yeah, these, these very common socio-technical challenges such as you know, poorly sized systems because you know, you've, you've kind of missed designed um, the the size of the system you know if it's and and what happens is if it's oversized that's generally too expensive for the community and if it's undersized then you know the community gets very frustrated because there's not enough electricity and power for them and you know both both sides of this problem kind of leads to slow or or low demand and then that means that there's insufficient revenue for the for the mini grid and then there's also a lot of conflict that could happen so how we've, as an organization, decided to um, or, or have been working on what we've been working on to kind of address some of these. And it really builds on also the Amartya Sen's human capability approach um, in thinking about you know, the starting point being communities being able to decide for themselves what capabilities and functionings they would like and how are they able to participate in and be involved in making those decisions. I mean, these things are very important. And then looking at mini grids as a common pool resource that can be managed and, and that can leverage local you know, knowledge, experience, and institutions to, to manage these, this resource. Um, and so we've designed this tool that we call the Community Energy Toolkit or Comet, and it's a software tool. Um, and basically what it is, is it's a simulation of the mini grid system. And so 
what how we usually use it is we use it in focus group discussions or workshop settings with communities where you can create different um, mini grid systems and different scenarios around demand around you know different types of uh, levels of service around different types of um, financing options payment options and all these all these um usually technical or financial concepts of mini grid operations and um, using this tool through this workshop format um, communities can learn about mini grid operations and um, what we usually generally tend to use it for is usually to to you know for the community to better understand mini grids and their level of service the costs to them and really understand and align their expectations and understanding and for um, for the facilitators, it's understanding how communities read what their needs are, what their aspirations, the nuances, um, and then the, how do they make decisions? What are their values? And using all of this information to design and plan better mini grids with communities input. So the common process, um, I usually like to think of it as a three step process. Um, the first step is, you know, very, uh, it, it already leverages or, or complements existing practices, you know, using surveys and questionnaires to, to gather information on the community. But then what we do with that information is use in the common, use them in the common workshops to, to go through different scenarios with communities so that they can better understand what it means for them and then also provide input and, and their, their knowledge and experience to the facility, facilitator. And then what um, what comes out of the workshops is you know the, the facilitator does gather very um, it is quite data driven so they do get load profiles they get a sense of willingness to pay um, you know communities ability ability and willingness to pay as, as well in terms of you know monthly expected budgets and things like that and then there's all the outcomes as well that um, you know communities are are better knowledgeable about what the system um, will deliver to them. And so um, I just want to skip ahead to this. This is an example of um, one deployment that we've done in Somaliland in the Horn of Africa. Um, and we use this workshop in a planning phase of the project. So before the, the, the system was implemented and to really do, we ran it for demand assessment actually, and, and to really evaluate what, what are the actual energy needs. And so, um, you know, we really learned a lot from the community in terms of when their actual peaks were, um, what they were really using it for, what were their preferences in terms of appliances. And we went through different scenarios with them to try and bring down the cost of the system to a level of affordability that is appropriate for the community. And so then, you know, we were able to build that consensus around um, what level of service they are getting that that they would like and, and they would like to see for themselves. And, and, you know, we were able to hand over all those load profiles and information to the project developer to, to design the system around. And I think that is it for my presentation. Wow. Thank you, Ayu. Thank you for 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 that. I'm one um, pretty, pretty short question to to um, the, the practicalities of of this um, of this um, tool. Um, so you you uh, you have um, you prepare the the the, the conversation with, with the people and at, uh, by and created those scenarios of different realities of, of possible futures uh, during the during the workshops so it's kind of co co-designing game mm -hmm. that's right yeah so based on the information you know preliminary information whether that be in the form of some social baseline assessment um, mm -hmm. you know usually project developers would do all of that beforehand and so they have a lot of the you know communities demographics and 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 things like that and so we would use all of that to basically design different scenarios and and those um, would be designed with some input from maybe community leaders and elders um, and then through the workshops we would go through those scenarios with the communities and of course sometimes there's there's a lot of flexibility and adjusting on the spot 
Um, so if we recognize that you know one scenario is is not working for the community, we're able to do those adjustments, you know, in real time so that the community can see for themselves um, what those decisions mean for their energy use and and the level of service that they're paying for. And so it's really walking the community through that without you know having through to install. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your what happened if? Wow, uh, uh, Emmanuel, please uh, come with us to the stage. And so we uh, are now. We I would like to open now the discussion. So please uh, and, and invite again our audience to share uh, their thoughts or their um, questions. I would like also to highlight one comment from Reginas uh, Mafumo, uh, he points at other types of tools that uh, has been uh, applied, developed and applied, for example, the community-based planning tool, which was um, developed, I guess, or mentioned for, by practical action in Southern Africa. Um, and yes, there are there are some tools out there in, in, in the space, which more or less does the same, um, yeah, the same aim of bridging these gaps. Also, uh, both of you, uh, uh, Ayu and Emmanuel, highlighted or, or pointed at this gap that sometimes or the very often probably is still happening that uh, planning um, of, of energy access interventions in general, uh, very often the, 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 this piece of, of understanding the uh, community's uh, own priorities is not always taking enough attention. So I I, I would like to, to know um, what what could be like the, the main or from your experience, uh, um, Emmanuel. Um, how how can the how what are the main um, challenges in in bringing this collaboration? Um, I, we heard from the value of of of, in, of integrating uh, community uh, knowledge, knowledge. What are like the difficulties? Let let's start talking about that part. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so. Remember that the approach we are using is, is, is a little bit different from what has been used by most decision makers and planners. So one of the challenges that is always there is about uh, the aspect of resistance through siloed planning approaches. So re remember what we are, we are talking about is that by working with the community, you are answering the question, energy for what? And in doing that, it means then the, the deliverers of the service need to reach across sectors. For example, here we are talking about energy in relation to income, improved income from farming. So alone you cannot do that planning without involving, involving people in the agricultural sector. Now, the biggest challenge is that there is this aspect you are used to doing siloed planning and if somebody is telling you you need now to think about working with the other sectors of course there are a lot of what you'll call insecurities from different actors both from the energy whether they are losing their main role and from the department of agriculture team which is thinking now this other department is trying to sub on our role so so there's that aspect and then um there is, the, there is the component, especially when we are working with the community, the issue of language barrier. Remember that we practitioners are normally communicating in English in the Kenyan context. So it's either in English or Kiswahili. But when you go down to the village, because you are planning, the communities that you're actually working with the communities to know their priority development needs to guide you to plan, you realize that when you use the technical terms and the language used in this field, you are not really communicating. So we are forced then to use the local dialect. So you'll find that without you incorporating the use of the local dialect, um, you might not achieve much impact. So that was the barrier that we experienced earlier on. <clears throat> but 
in going through the process, uh, especially during the community workshops, we realized that the first two days we didn't really bring sectoral experts into place. Uh, the first two days were just the facilitators who were like the implementers of the planning activity and the community. But because we are working across sectors, on the third day, we invited the sector experts to come and join the community to discuss about the priority development needs. So during that particular third day, we realized that uh, there was this aspect of the sector experts wanting to dominate the discussion and really trying to uh, force, for lack of a better term, force ideas or solution to the community members uh, on the understanding that they are knowledgeable about the sector. But trying to make them understand that really, if your approach was the best approach, then this unmet need will not be there meaning there is already a gap and therefore there is need for you to listen and engage closely with the community members. And surprisingly, some of the issues that the community members have been raising through these discussions, um, the practitioners or the experts haven't really been aware of them. So, so there's the challenge that I know it all and you being a community member, you really can't tell me anything about that particular sector. Yeah, and then the I think the last challenge was is about political buy-in and the issue of ownership. So remember, still the aspect of siloed buying, but again, uh, the political class sometimes didn't appreciate the enabling role of energy. So when you're trying uh, to the, the the linkages between energy and development. It's not fully yes. clear for some some political actors. Yes. So, so for example, the way the government, both national and the county, works is that a staff from the other department cannot just walk in without getting express permission from their seniors, and most of the seniors are political appointee. So, when you are, when they go to ask, we like to join this exercise because they are doing energy planning and it's important in our sector. Now, the, the individual just wonder, what is the relationship between energy and health? Uh, and you see the, there is that challenge. And uh, for, for us, then it needed a lot of socialization uh, just to unlock that challenge that we needed to do a lot of capacity awareness to both the political, to political players as well as the decision makers using basic examples on why certain sectors will not operate the, at optimal without the component of energy. Hence, they need to collaborate with the, all these other sectors. And by doing that, then we are able to, to really to raise uh, awareness of that the topics. Yes. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, are you, um, will, will you uh, complement that, that list of already of, of challenges? or? Do you have any other? I mean, I, I agree with with all those challenges. I think, and then and then we're thinking about politics as well. I mean, it come, it also starts to to uh, touch into different you know regulatory environments um, around you know very practical terms around uh, are you implementing energy systems, agricultural systems, all of those things in rural contexts, which some governments have just not really. Um, thought of, you know, so that there's kind of that added challenge of of doing that, um, especially in in a lot of developing countries where where there's just not any regulations around um, infrastructure in in rural and remote areas, especially ones that are not installed by the government. <laughs> um, so I think I think yeah, I, I would echo a lot of that. Um, yeah. We we got a, a a question from from Divian uh, Nakpal. Uh, which may be interesting to hear from you, are you your 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 ideas on that? To what extent do private sector mini grid developers currently integrate community engagement within their business model? Is there sufficient capital available to them for engaged communities for understand how do we balance? I, I'm trying to shorten. How do we balance the interests of private sector mini grid developers who 
uh, likely one timely returns which need not necessarily always match the full needs of the community what are your experience on on that yeah kind of yeah. kind of dichotomy <laughs> yeah um <laughs> yeah so um could you could you uh the, the beginning of that question I, I caught the last one what was the yeah, first sorry. part of to what extent do private sector mini grid developers currently integrate community engagement within their business model okay so there's two kind of two sides to that question so first is like you know uh, current practices with, with private uh, mini grid developers and then the second question would be around how do they balance um you know their their current uh, needs or the way projects are currently set up as well and, and the needs of the community. That's kind of how I'm reading it. Um, so the first part to that question around uh, what are some current practices? I mean, I think conventional uh, practices, a lot of times uh, private developers will run questionnaire surveys. They'll do focus group discussions. Um, the, the surveys and household questionnaires sometimes are door to door. Um, so it's, it's really right now just just based on on you know a lot of uh, the experience from the field it's it's that kind of minimum level that i was talking about just now where it's a one-way exchange and and it's to you know kind of elicit the the information from the community in order for them to be able to design their systems to something that makes sense for the community um i think that there could be more you know involvement in community engagement obviously and, and that's kind of where we're coming from. We're, we're trying to create a tool that we can put in the hands of uh, project developers and operators that, that you know, makes it easier for them to actually engage with the community in, in a way that um, you know, doesn't take up a lot of time, doesn't take up a lot of costs, right? I mean, if you're already doing focus group discussions, use the tool, um, you know, have your workshop sessions with the community and, and, and try and and um, have that two-way exchange with the community and and i think that this is a comet is a nice tool for project developers to to use to complement their existing practices and add to them in order to really you know be able to get um fuller fuller demand estimates revenue estimates willingness to pay from communities um so i, th I think there's more that can be done um and i think that um, I would love to see more stakeholders in the sector kind of innovate in this space of trying to come up with more tools for but, project but, developers to do this. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, but part of the question, uh, if I can move it a little bit, uh, of, of, of Ivan is uh, that this will cost, will this include or this implies additional cost? Uh, mm -hmm. An additional probably okay. You you mentioned already the possibility to, to facilitate and short time through through good good developed tools. Um, is this something that uh, how how can a, a private sector developer how how they include this in their cost structures? Is this something that yeah. is uh, how? Yeah. yeah. So this this is the you know the second part of the question where it's challenging for for project developers because right now. Uh, funding structures and the way projects are set up, um, it doesn't it doesn't prioritize community engagement. It doesn't prioritize you know that that part of it that really um, that really requires uh, project developers to go down to the communities and 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 get information with communities, right? And so I think uh, yeah, it does. It's it's a bit of a struggle because this this part of community engagement, which everybody in the sector acknowledges as very important and key, isn't given priority when it comes down to investment and funding and, and how it flows, you know, um, in, in project cycle. And so that needs to that needs to change. I mean, if we're going to acknowledge that this is a very important and key part of it, then obviously there needs to be investment being put towards it. Um, for project developers, that's their struggle, right? The struggle is is the, the funding doesn't really allow them um, time and, and resources to do this. And so there needs to be um, some change, I think, from from you know investors and donors to 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 recognize that this is important, and and that does translate into cost savings in the long run. I mean, if you design a system that is better matched um, to communities' needs and aspirations, and where there is a lot alignment of expectations, you will have better you know demand, better revenue, um, better you know repayment of the systems, lower customer side risk, basically, is, is what how we like to think of it, is that what we're trying to do is mitigate end user risks around right. conflict, around 
non-buy in and all of that. And yeah. probably other other way of argumenting is uh, more from a cost benefit balance or so probably more politically probably not from the private private investor but from more government perspective that the benefit the the, the cost benefit balance at the end if you take this time the benefits uh, might be wider or, or deeper yeah it cuts um, across all levels yeah yeah yeah, yeah, it's a kind of yeah cross levels awareness on on the on the potentials of of this community involvement. How, how has been your your uh, experience, Emmanuel, in in the involvement? We we have had the focus, of course, in our webinar on the involvement of of communities. How is the involvement of the private sector on those on those um, on those process that you that you have been uh, accompanying? I always got like the role and possibilities. Yeah, um, the, the involvement of the private sector actually comes in at the initial design phase. Uh, remember, I mentioned about the community not just having the end users, but in doing stakeholder mapping, you realize that among the people you need to have within your group are the people who are articulating their private needs the people who are helping you to think and develop about the solutions and the people who are going to implement or help you implement the solution. Now, I look at that question in two ways. The flip side is that if the private sector doesn't get involved in the process, remember them are uh, profit driven, right? Now, imagine a scenario where the private sector is promoting standalone systems, say water pumping for irrigation. They, they sell this, the, the, the system initially, but the farmer will only be able to pay for the system if they generate income out of that system. Therefore, the private sector plus the other sectors need to come into play so that the farmer will be motivated to continuously use the system if the market for the produce exists. Without the market, the farmer will not be motivated to continue using the system. Hence, the ripple effect is that if they don't use the system, they are unable to pay for that particular system if it's like a system given on credit. I believe even for, for IU, the mini, the mini grid, if somebody is paying for that without the motivation to put that energy into use, it becomes quite a challenging for them to continuously sustain using the, the system. So from, from our experience, uh, and here is not only at the private sector, we're even looking at the national service utility like Kenya Power, where some of the end users ha do not have the ability to repay their monthly bills because there is a a gap in that they cannot put the energy into use, right? And so without then all players coming together, I believe it's it's not an ideal solution. And despite the limitations of like the private sector wanting to do anything, perhaps the other way of looking at it is could all the players then start thinking collaboratively instead of thinking in silos because one of the gaps that the private sector investor will have for example investing in an energy system will focus more on the system itself and perhaps what is it going to to, to what kind of solution is going to to address right but beyond addressing that solution the end user is not really interested in this particular solution like i lack energy i'm looking at my bigger development needs yeah may i want income not that i'm getting income because of a solar system that is working well no the bottom line is income so then who are the other players that we need to make sure that this farmer really gets income so i will look at it from that perspective yeah, yeah, and for that, I, I think this this uh, hint to cross sectoral or to I don't know connecting silos probably or or, or yeah connecting borders. Yeah. Quite quite interesting. Perhaps yeah. breaking the silos. 
Not sure. Probably it's, it's pro <laughs> that's too revolutionary. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I like to think uh, about us as experts in energy. It is good that we are experts in energy, our expertise and in detail. Probably somehow, I don't know, I will put it probably opening the windows and trying to connect and understand uh, between silos, but I don't know. <laughs> Breaking the silos, not sure. But definitively, uh, there are knowledge. Uh, I, I like your 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 um, example of of the farmer with a, a solar pump. Uh, it's nice to have uh, more water for irrigation, but probably that will not be the only factor in order to increase productivity and to get to the market. So probably new techniques, to new agricultural techniques, will probably will be uh, more helpful. Probably you need also a better understanding of the market's possibilities of marketing support, uh, <clears throat> to explore other markets. So there are a lot of things that are not energy but are so important that this energy really is useful yeah yeah and probably uh, we, we still have like uh, four, uh more than three minutes so i would like you to give us like your last uh, recommendation to our audience and to all that uh, that want to make really impactful energy access projects are you what will be your key recommendation um, I think I, I'm going to actually um, kind of build, build on, you know, Emmanuel and, and, and my presentations here that um, I think we're all right now kind of the, the SDG 7 uh, tracking report just came out yesterday. And so we're all now kind of feeling that urgency of, of, of you know, we're not going to hit um, our target of SDG 7 if we, if we don't change things. But I think I think you know something that we both echoed today is that um, the the goal, the main ultimate goal that we need to be thinking about here, um, if we really want to change how we do things, that goal we need to reorient ourselves to what that goal is. Is our goal to really deliver like energy access, or is our goal to deliver development outcomes? And I think that that creates very different um, priorities and very different methods and and processes. And so I would like to kind of like put that challenge out there and, and, and kind of get people to, to try and think of what are we doing this for? Is it to deliver energy or is it to really de deliver development? Very encouraging <laughs> question. Emmanuel, <laughs> what would you be your last yeah, statement? I think, I, I think for mine, it will be quite, uh, quite basic, but uh, when you're planning for energy, you need to put the community at the center, at the core of the planning process. And not only the community being there to be seen, but they have to contribute meaningfully to the discussions. From my experience, I realized that these community members, this, uh, regardless of the technologies you are trying to promote, they will tell you the gaps. Because believe me, it's not you are not the first one to start promoting these technologies. Others have come, they have tried it with the same communities and they have different results. And the only people who will tell you the barriers that made that the technology not work is actually the community members. So the best thing to do is make the community your allies and you'll be able to address most of the challenges, what you'll call the tipping challenges that you experience when you're trying to promote energy access. Super, then we managed exactly uh, one hour. Thank you to you both for, for your insights. It was wonderful to hear your, your experience and your, your observations and reflections. For our audience, uh, two things. First, keep uh, tuned with us. This is the second one. The third webinar will uh, be announced uh, um, in the last in the next weeks we will um, approach the question of productive uses of energy so going into this more specific topic that we all already hear about it today and this will be probably in two months uh, that's the one thing and the second thing we have a very small survey as a feedback from you that we would like to know from your from your experience and we would like to learn more how you 
got this 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 talk and how we can we improve thank you very much and yeah see you in the next time bye bye thank you bye thank you